This is Samuel and Will, and how to read the Bible is today's topic. It's going to be great. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to go through. So, just to preface, we have some stuff to talk about. Uh, first one, Scripture is God's special revelation to us. So that's one thing to keep in mind is uh, the Bible is literally God speaking to us and revealing himself to us in history. Um, the next thing is we have to have good exegesis um, because it's essential to knowing God rightly. Mm -hmm. As in, if we don't interpret the meaning of the Bible correctly, we aren't actually going to have the true picture of who God is. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the next point on this is culture, time, and language. We're going to talk this, about this more in the lecture, but it's basically the idea that this is a river that we have to cross because it's separating us from the true meaning of the Bible, as in the biblical texts were in a different culture, a different time, and different language. And so that is one of the most important things to recognize. And then the last thing uh, before we get into prayer is we are influenced by our culture, okay? So we have to know our, uh, any bias we have or any presuppositions we have or anything that culture is saying that might influence us. We have to keep that in mind so that we don't read something into the Bible instead of extracting the message out of the Bible. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, so we're going to quick pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time together, uh, a time to just talk about you and uh, teach people about your word. Uh, I ask that you bless this time and let your Holy Spirit work in everyone's mind and heart. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right, as you know, we love to start with a quote and a sweet picture. I picked it out. It's really cool. Um, <clears throat> so when we pray, we talk to God, and when we read scripture, God talks to us. I just love the simplicity of that quote and just like, um, can people directly hear from God? That's happened in scripture. That's, you know, that's a possibility, I think. But the most sure foundation we have of hearing from God and what he's actually saying is scripture, what he's revealed to us in his word. And so um, that is our most direct communication we can have with, with God. And what is the Bible? <laughs> it's an important question to start with. Um, it's a collection of 66 books. Uh, with different, you know, literary genres that we're going to talk about a bunch. Um, written over 1,500 years of time, over 40 different authors in multiple languages. And so it is amazing that all of those books have been compiled together, and they all form a cohesive whole. So they're interwoven together. There's a unity to the whole of Scripture. The way we're putting it is it's like hyperlinked on steroids. It's kind of um, the phrase we're coming up with here. But it's true. It's so interconnected. And it's amazing to see, I actually think it's, it's sort of a piece of evidence for Christianity is to see the amazing interconnectedness of the Old and New Testaments and the vast span, like, expanse of time that they're written over, but how connected they are. And the last point to keep in mind is that it's progressively revelatory. So God, we know more about God in the New Testament than we do in the Old. He has progressively revealed himself to us. Um, so the Trinity became more clear by the end of Revelation than it was in the beginning of scripture. So just important to keep that in mind. And I also, there's a conscious, I think that there's clear evidence from scripture that there's a sort of self-conscious awareness that this process of scripture being written is, was guided and authored by the Holy Spirit. So we can see like places in the Psalms or Isaiah and Daniel in the Old Testament where um, there's kind of a self-conscious awareness that what's being written down here is being guided by God's spirit. And then in the New Testament, Jesus constantly refers back to the scriptures as being authoritative Paul speaks of the Gospels as being authoritative. Peter speaks of Paul's writings as being authoritative, all lumped under that term scripture. So there's kind of a self-conscious awareness of what's happening here is authoritative and from God, which I think is important to, to note. Okay. <clears throat> uh, different views of interpretation. We're going to go through three views of how to interpret the Bible but then we're going to make sure you know the correct view, and we're going to go really in-depth into that view. So we have the reader response model, which is like, oh, what do you think it means? And then we have the psychological model, with, which is very popular today, which is basically, oh, the Bible is great for utility. And then the correct view, which is like, if you go to a strong seminary, this is what you would be taught. 
um, it would be authorial intent. So what is the author's intent behind the message? And those are just a few examples. There's a bunch more, but these are the most popular that we thought would be very good to go over. So what we're calling reader response is this idea. It's somewhat influenced by stuff we've already talked about in previous lectures, but postmodern, postmodernism, subjectivism, and relativism. Um, on an individual level, this is kind of the idea that the individual's opinion is kind of the source or foundation of whatever this passage means. And so an example of this that probably comes up a lot in Bible studies is, what does this passage mean to you? And we've talked about before how there's, there's some good in that, but there's a lot of danger in, in saying, what does this passage mean to me as, a, as like divorced from or as opposed to whatever the actual author meant by the passage? And so we want to make a strong, um, actually, and then on a cultural level, it comes in the same way. It's just not an individual doing it. It's a whole culture deciding we're going to relativize this portion of scripture or whatever and make it say what we want. Um, and the helpful way to distinguish here is application versus meaning. So in, in the application of a passage, if I read like Psalm 23 and it says, the Lord is my shepherd, there's a ton of different ways that that applies to my life that is different than the person next to me. Or like, I will think different things about what it means for the Lord to be my shepherd that are unique to me and that are good. And we shouldn't say that that's all bad and relativistic. That's not true. It's good. Uh, but we just need to distinguish between the application to our lives and then the actual meaning of the text. Those are just a good thing to keep in mind. So there is some amount of subjectivity involved in the application of a text, right? And that can change depending on the person or the culture. It might look different. But the actual meaning of the text, we have to keep in mind that there is, there is an objective meaning to what the text means. Um, so that's just a helpful thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> Our next one. Uh, so we obviously reference Jordan Peterson and Lord of the Rings a lot, but this is a model that Jordan Peterson uh, uses and has made very popular. Actually, he has led a lot of people to Christ just by using this model, right? So um, if you read any of his books, he actually cites scriptures like very frequently. If you read one of his books, you'll run into the biblical passages all the time. But uh, his view is, is a little flawed, even though it's very helpful. So one is it relies on evolutionary psychology, as in it's essentially still uh, focusing on, on the person. So the Bible is important because of utility. So there are very helpful things. So he would say that the Bible is a good foundation for a society and an individual because of the values it holds. And it's, and it's great to use that. And we, he would actually go as far to say, like, it would be kind of impossible to have the civilization we have today without that foundation. All right, so essentially it's just very helpful. And I wanna make a distinction here in, in psychology because there's two views. There's uh, Sigmund Freud, so his view. Um, he would say that like everything is driven by like our sexual desires or something like that. And so if someone was interpreting the Bible from that standpoint, it would be very superficial and surface level. But the reason Jordan Peterson became so popular on this is because he's a Jungian psychologist, so he follows Carl Jung, and he basically says that there are like these universal truths, these archetypes, and things that we see in everyone, and the Bible is, uh, is part of that, and so it speaks those types of truths, and so it gets very deep, and so that's why he's able to get so close and lead people to Christ mm -hmm. because of, of that view, and um, the only other thing I would say on that is, when it comes down to it, Jordan Peterson would still say religion is a psychological phenomenon and very meaningful to uh, human existence. Mm -hmm. right. And then the one that we're gonna settle on as the, the right one, uh, the one we think is, is the best model to follow is what we would call authorial intent. What was the intent of the original author? Who is he writing to? And what message was he trying to convey to this original audience? Uh, this is, again, like if you're going through seminary, um, any pastor here at Grace was kind of taught under this model of this is how you interpret a scripture passage. Um, and so this is, this is with the presupposition that there is an objective meaning to the text that is discoverable to us. Um, it's not just vague and opaque, but there actually is a meaning, and we have to do the hard work and the legwork of um, crossing that cultural river and finding out what the text means. Um, there's easier passages and harder passages with this, obviously. So like an even simple one, though, that I think everybody could understand is like, uh, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That actually, there is a cultural divide there. We don't know what the word yoke really is today. We don't, we don't use what, we don't use a yoke. 
but it doesn't take a huge gap to learn what a yoke is and how that applies um, to us today and like the meaning behind that, or just shepherds and stuff. There's a cultural divide there, but it's not a huge one. But there's other passages of scripture where it's a bigger divide or a bigger language divide, and we have to do even more legwork to kind of figure out what the meaning is. But the main point is that there is a meaning that was meant to convey something. And so just kind of a point on language, like we are objective about these things. There is uh, words refer to actual concepts and ideas that are objective and true, and they convey a message. It requires interpretation from the receiving end. And uh, if language just kind of means whatever we want, then there would be no point in really communicating at all, and we're just kind of uttering sounds out of our mouths. So we're Christians. We don't, we don't think like that. <clears throat> Perfect. All right, we're going to get into the 10 principles of biblical interpretation. So these 10 things. Um, so if you want to write anything down that's very helpful, I'd say write down each principle. Um, and then at the end, we're also going to go through the different genres of the Bible. Okay, so our first one, principle number one, we uh, obviously we just went through the authorial intent model. And so obviously the first principle is what is the author's intended meaning? Okay, so you would have to look at the original audience and the actual author and try and figure out the situation that arose to cause this writing. So the example we're going to use is the letter to the Romans. So Paul was writing to the Christian church in Rome and these people because there was a conflict and we have to do the legwork to figure out the conflict and it's uh, it's not too hard to figure out especially in our day when we have so many resources but we would have to keep that in mind and so that's the first principle so if you are interpreting a Bible verse or a Bible passage in Romans you would have to make sure it actually lines up with the topic and what Paul is talking about and trying to convey to this audience because there's an obvious problem going on in the church that he had to address. Mm -hmm. So here it would not be the reader's point of view. It wouldn't be, um, hey, this is what I feel like it means. It would be, hey, what is the answer to this solution that Paul is kind of telling us? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that's principle number one. Number two is context is key. Probably heard this before, uh, but it is key. It's super important. And uh, kind of a tagline to say is that we never just read a Bible verse. If somebody provides you a Bible verse, the red flag should come up to some extent. Um, and if you get like a difficult passage thrown at you or one difficult Bible verse, nine times out of 10, you can go back and look at the whole passage in context and light is often shed on the one passage, whether it's difficult or you don't really know what it means or it's troublesome or it's making you think like, why would God do this? Um, going back, taking a look, taking a breath, reading the whole passage in context often sheds a lot of light on what we would think of as a difficult verse. So never read just a Bible verse. It's kind of a good rule of thumb. And as, a, as an example, the statement, it was a ball, could refer to, we could be talking about dancing, a baseball game, um, whether it was an exciting time or not, you know, I had a ball. So depending on the context, it could mean any of those things. That's a pretty simple idea. We all know that. But it is important as we work through scripture to keep that in mind. Yeah. All right, principle number three. This one is uh, very good. So it's interpret literally, allowing for normal use of figurative language. So a lot of people like to go to both extremes. Some people say, hey, let's interpret every single word of the Bible literally. And like not use figurative language. But then there are the uh, people that go kind of like the opposite route and say, oh yeah, everything in the Bible is just conveying some spiritual message and isn't like a literal thing. Mm -hmm. Especially, uh, that happens especially with uh, certain difficult passages um, like Genesis. So if you look at the beginning of Genesis, a lot of people like to go to the extremes and not meet in the middle. So um, if you're reading a biblical passage, a good rule of thumb is take it at face value unless there's kind of reason to believe figurative language is being used. And it's, and it's pretty intuitive uh, when, when you're actually reading. So the example we give is trees clapping their hands, okay? Well, obviously, if, if we took that literally, we would have to say, hey, the trees literally grew hands and started clapping. Mm -hmm. That's kind of absurd. So we would then say, hey, it's figurative language. Um, and that's a, like, it's okay to say something is figurative. It's not um, heresy to say, oh, hey, this specific uh, section should be taken figuratively if we have reasons for it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, 
if we took all of the statements about who God is in the Psalms, we would have something like a fire-breathing dragon with feathers and wings and stuff like that. So there's clear examples, and then, but that doesn't mean that there isn't some gray area that's difficult. Genesis mm-hmm. is historically a very difficult text where it's, there's a gray area, and it's like, okay, what genre is this exactly? And it's unique. So that's a whole other thing. We have a talk on that, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so principle four is scripture interprets scripture. So we should interpret the difficult passages of Scripture in light of more clear texts from Scripture. It's a good rule of thumb to keep in mind. And we do this because we know that God can't contradict himself. So the law of non-contradiction, um, kind of taking the plain reading of the text at face value, and yeah, not we just know that these two passages can't contradict each other, and we work with that assumption because God is truth and he can't contradict himself. Mm. But we in- interpret clear or interpret difficult texts in light of clear ones. Yeah, and under that law of contradiction, when we said plain reading comes before conclusions, what a lot of people do is they take one passage and another passage, interpret them separately, follow them to their like philosophical and theological conclusions, and then they end up like contradicting each other yeah. and not reading both in light of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you are uh, like one day reading one passage and the next day reading another Keep both in mind, especially if they're on the same general topic, um, because you don't want to run into that situation. It it gets kind of messy where you're like, oh, I was so sure about this passage and my belief on that, but then when I read this one, problems came up, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So yeah. All right, principle number five is uh, interpretation as opposed to application, right? We mentioned this before, uh, but it's... It's very, very important because you'll, you'll hear it a lot today with subjectivism, but application versus the actual meaning. So the meaning does not change. It is there. It is objective, unchanging, applies to everyone. Um, now, again, how you go by applying that is going to look differently. So our example is pick up your cross and follow me. So that, that saying, a lot of Christians have heard it. Um, now... Of course, that would essentially mean us turning to Jesus, all of us, right? Um, But people struggle with different sins, or specific sins are more difficult for certain people than other people. And so, like, in that respect, it would vary a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's that's another thing right there is just interpretation as opposed to application. Make sure you make that distinction. And interpretation always comes... First, so if you're in like a Bible group and they go straight to, oh, how do we apply this? You should like really strive for, hey, let's figure out what it's saying first. Let's figure out what it means first. What mm-hmm. what principle is underlying it all? Yeah. Uh, number six is to be sensitive to following themes, and not just these two. These aren't the only two themes in Scripture. These are two really big ones though that are super important. Um, and just as a side note, if you guys don't know what the Bible Project is, this is they're a really, really helpful video series that will take like a summary of each book of the Bible and place it in the whole context of the whole of Scripture, how it relates to the whole narrative as a whole. Uh, it's super helpful. So like if you're starting a new book in your Bible study or we're starting a new book in at Grace or something, 2 Corinthians or whatever it is, um, you it's really good to like take notes on one of their summary videos and it really gives you kind of a whole holistic look on how this book fits in with the whole rest of Scripture. Really, really helpful. But some themes that are very common in Scripture that kind of show up all over the place is like Israel and the church as a comparison between the two. How Israel in the Old Testament is functioning as like a temporal nation of people, and then the church being like the fulfillment of Israel, but a universal thing, all nations, tribes, tongues, being part of the church, and it's the fulfillment of Israel. So it's like the true Israel is the church. Um, And there's like temporal aspects to the Israel as a nation in the Old Testament, temporal consequences, temporal punishments, and then in the church, it's more eternal. There's eternal punishment, um, eternal promises, things like that. Um, So it's just that theme of like type and then fulfillment of of the type. And then old and new covenants, very similar. So old law of Moses, new covenant, law of Christ, uh, just keeping that in mind as you read the Old Testament, even if you're reading like the law in the Old Testament, like Numbers or Leviticus, seeing how this is fulfilled in the New Testament or the New Covenant with Jesus is really, really cool. And it kind of opens up the scriptures to you. Like, I would say that the thing that made me so excited about 
reading the Bible as a Christian, was to see how the Old Testament was kind of made alive by the New Testament. That's when things really start to click and it gets really, really cool to read scripture. You start to read Leviticus and you're like, oh, wow, there's a ton of stuff about Jesus in here, actually. There's reasons why it talks about like bitter herbs at Passover. And you're like, I would have never have thought that. But there's actually a ton of meaning behind those things and symbolism. And so it really opens up the whole of scripture when you know that there's actual intention behind each of those things mm -hmm. that we think of as like obscure laws of the Old Testament. Oftentimes they're not obscure. Yeah. So just keep in mind those themes. And, and actually what helps with that, um, obviously today we have study Bibles, but also just like a simple reference Bible. Mm -hmm. Those passages that do connect to the Old Testament, if you have a reference Bible, it'll tell you what passage to go to. And then you can go back and say, whoa, I didn't know that actually connected to the Old Testament. So yeah, look out for that. And if you have just like a simple reference Bible, it'll help a lot. Yeah. All right, principle number seven, uh, layers of meaning. So we, we talked a lot about, hey, there is an objective meaning. Okay, there's one meaning that's unchanging. But another thing to keep in mind is that with one passage, it can send, uh, it can give you multiple messages that are true. So uh, for example, there could be multiple allusions to the Old Testament in one New Testament um, passage, or there can be multiple references, or in, in the New Testament, especially with the Gospels and Jesus, there could be multiple prophecies being fulfilled at the same time, right? And so um, multiple things can be happening um, at once. So just make sure you're, you're realizing that. So like um, one thing to, well, actually, Will was going to talk about this, typology. Yeah. yeah. So typology is just another kind of principle to keep in mind as you read scripture. It's kind of all over the place. Um, and it can go too far, but it's also really cool to, if, when it's done right, I think it's actually really cool. But it can go too far. Uh, in my small group, I remember, Ben, you'll, you'll remember this, but I, I kind of made a joke of when people are, when a pastor talking about typology, you often think, is he onto something or is he on something? It's kind of the two questions. Like, is he on drugs or is he actually like really onto something here? Um, when we're talking about typology related to Jesus, that is often very valid because Jesus says, all of the scriptures speak about me in the Old Testament. He's saying, the scriptures refer to me. And he go like on the Emmaus road, he takes his dis disciples back to the Old Testament and from like the law of Moses through the prophets saying all the things in the scriptures that pertain to Jesus. So it's like, we should be looking for it. We should be looking for connections to Jesus. A clear one would be like Melchizedek in Genesis. He's this priest of the most high God who brings bread and wine as an offering. Okay, does that start to ring bells, bread and wine? Um, clearly there's a connection there between him and Jesus. So that's typology, there, there's a type um, and then Jesus is the fulfillment of that type, or Adam and Christ. That's a, that's a specific one that's laid out in Romans 5. Paul uses that as a comparison between Adam, or the, the first Adam, and then the second Adam, which is Jesus. So there's, there's places where scripture actually does this for us, and I do think that there are places where it's not explicit, that we can start to draw it out. Like I think the story of Joseph in Genesis, I think there are themes that connect to Jesus, like his descent into the lowest parts, like uh, he goes to the pit basically, he's in prison, and then he gets ascended back up to a huge place of authority and status. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like Jesus in Philippians 2, mm -hmm. his huge descent in humility, and then his ascent being named, the name above every name. I think there's tons of cool connections there um, that we can look for, and especially with Jesus because Jesus tells us to mm -hmm. look for that. Um, now, in church history, I think that typology uh, can go amok. It, it can go a little too far. An example of that would be, um, I, I think, as a Protestant, the Roman Catholic Church um, will use typology with Mary a little too much. So they find a lot of uh, doctrines related to Mary from typology. Not explicit texts of scripture, but they will infer it from things. And this, the scary bit, if we don't have any sort of lid on the typology thing, is you can kind of just make up anything. Um, that doesn't mean there's no typology with Mary. I actually think there is, but I think that it can go too far. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating topic and, and too much to get into now, but yeah. Yeah, and then one, one last thing on this, I'm, I'm gonna make our uh, bi-weekly Lord of the Rings reference, which is, uh, which is in, in the story of Lord of the Rings, when you ask, okay, what themes is Tolkien, uh, Tolkien getting at, you aren't just going to come up with one, right? There are multiple. So one theme he will be getting at is like um, companionship, brotherhood, 
right? And another theme is uh, like sin or something is wrong with the world, something is wrong with humans. That's another thing. Um, but also, you could hit the theme of good triumphing, right? There, there's that theme. Uh, so a story can hit a bunch of themes at once, mm -hmm. right? It's uh, especially complex stories like the Bible. And the Bible, as Will said earlier, is the most complex and hyperlinked and, uh, uh, hyperlinked story there mm -hmm. is. So, yeah. And also, we had a picture of Treebeard earlier for, for one of our pictures. And that's from Lord of the Rings, if you didn't know that. <laughs> got it. Oh, wait, no, I got yeah, it. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so culture, uh, principle eight, just recognizing culture, language, and time. So the principle there, culture, language, time. Um, this is kind of that cultural river that we have to cross. When we're doing good exegesis of a text, we have to keep those things in mind that we are working with a different culture, a different language, and a different time. And also not only that, but how influenced we are by our own culture as we read different texts. And so with culture, there's many involved within the scriptures. There's kind of the ancient Near East culture, which is the setting for a lot of the Old Testament, especially like the first five books. Um, then there's, in the New Testament, like Hellenistic or Greek. That's what Hellenistic means, a Greek-influenced culture in the New Testament. Um, an example of this would be like slavery. The concept of slavery that we think of today um, is like the chattel, really br brutal slavery of the American South. And that doesn't map onto exactly what slavery was like, especially for like ancient Israelites where like God in Exodus is actually like describing the proper way for slavery to be done, which to us sounds insane. But um, in the Old Testament with the ancient Israelites, it was more akin to like indentured servitude, where the Israelites didn't have a social safety net, like welfare. So like the idea of a poor Israelite with a family could like sell himself into service to one of his fellow brethren, mm -hmm. that idea and like working off his debt, that idea to us still seems like immoral today, but back then that was a pretty good gig. <laughs> there, there wasn't anything else there, like there wasn't a government to help him out. And so we have to keep in mind when we like read these words like slavery or, or different concepts, we are reading a lot of meaning into those passages that it doesn't necessarily have, like in Exodus. Um, just one example, language, Greek and Hebrew. Um, they're very different languages. They work quite a bit differently and they have different functions and stuff. And so. We have to keep in mind, you have to do some difficult work of figuring out what, you know, what are the different principles of Greek or Hebrew. Um, that's what a, a good pastor does. So, mm -hmm. and then time, 1500 years of time or 2000 years of time. That's been since the 3,500 years of time since it's been <laughs> all of scripture uh, to now is there's a lot of these differences are just accentuated over time, you know, and th that divide can just get bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of that cultural river that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, so a good book to read is. Oh yeah, misreading scripture with Western eyes. Mm -hmm. That's a great book. So a lot of, I mean, a lot of people actually have a lot of trouble with the idea of, oh, I can't figure out what it means because I don't know the culture, I don't know the language, I don't uh, like. It's been too long, too much has changed. Um, and there are plenty of books to actually look into, uh, but this one is good because it's for like the common people. It's not the most academic book you can get out there, and it's actually pretty short, but it goes over a bunch of ideas and very common things that are completely different in our time that were, um, that were different way, way back then in the biblical times. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it goes over all those things, and it's actually really cool. And it specifically focuses on Western culture, so which would be our American culture. Um, very much so. So it kind of calls you out on a bunch of things where you'll be reading the book and it'll be like, hey, the Bible actually views things this way. And you'll be like, oh, yeah, I've been uh, I've had a bias there uh, the whole time I've been reading the Bible. But um, super short, easy book to read. Also, not very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, get into that. It's, it's really, really cool. And also reference it to people if you know anyone that really has anxiety about that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And there are even some people that like don't believe in Christianity because they think, oh, it's too old to know anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then principle number nine, this all kind of goes together. Uh, know your presuppositions, know your biases, know your culture. Um, and I'm gonna make a distinction between presuppositions and Biases. So presuppositions, I'm going to make more intellectual. So know those. So 
you have a belief system in your head and it's easy to read a biblical passage and just fit it into your system and be like, hey, that works for me. Um, but know, know your system and actually realize where it's difficult, uh, like what topics are difficult for your system to handle and, and just be aware of those. Um, and then biases, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of make those more emotional. So an example I'll give is, okay, let's say a, a feminist became a Christian and had a huge transformation. Well, if she reads all of those um, biblical passages about uh, gender roles, especially the sensitive topics, she might still have an emotional reaction that uh, may stop her from going all the way into finding what the passage is actually saying. So that's mm. that. So some of those sensitive topics can come up and um, give you like an emotional block. Yeah. Uh, so be aware of what really. Uh, well, if like I don't like using this word a lot, but be be aware of what triggers you, right? Um, <laughs> and and just know those. And then finally, we've said this multiple times, but know your culture. Um, it's pretty easy because you live in it. Just know what we believe and how our culture works and what it's saying because the Bible kind of goes against that a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Last principle before we get into the next kind of section that we're going we're gonna to burn through quick. we got a lot of slides. Yeah. So be sensitive to the type of literature that you're working with. We've hit on this already, but the Bible has lots of different genres that it works with. And there's actually differences between even in like narrative stories or histories I would say that there's actually differences between like the book of Acts, the book of Judges, and the Gospel. They're, they're all historical accounts, but there's actually some nuances that we're going to go into that are mm. quite cool. So yeah. it's, it's good to know the principles of each of these as you read a different book of the Bible. Yeah. And yeah, there, are, there is a lot of content, so this is going to be a longer talk, but uh, it's really cool. So we're going to get into all of it. Um, gotcha. So just a list of all the different types of literature that we kind of see. Um, Narrative history, law, wisdom, poetry, gospels, parables, acts, epistles, and then apocalyptic lit literature. Yeah, and we'll get into each of those, so don't think you have to memorize them right now, and this yeah. is all we're going to talk about. Um, but let's go to the first one. Uh, so narrative history. This is like, okay, this is a historical account. I think my favorite example is like the beginning of Luke, the gospel of Luke. So Luke's a historian, and he's very, very good at what he's doing. And so in Luke 1, 1 through 4, if you just read it, you're like, it sounds like I'm reading something very official. It says like, to the most excellent Theophilus, I am writing a historical account detailing all of the exact events that have happened here. And it's like, all right, this sets me up well. I know what I'm about to read. It's going to be you know, a faithful historical account of the events that have taken place. That's different than the Psalms, right? So that's a pretty easy one to, to distinguish. But so the application here is drawn from like the characters and the events in the story. Um, so an example would be like Judges, and Judges 3, there's different like uh, conquests that the Israelites have, um, and so it's like, it's a historical account, but we can still extract like, okay, God's delivering power or something like that. There's like a theological principle there, even though it is a historical account. That doesn't mean that it's just like we can't take any meaning from it, but it's like, what is it saying about God? What is it saying about man? Those are good questions to ask. Yeah. Next one, law. This one is uh, a little bit easier. Usually it's just a straightforward command, right? Um, so in those law books, it's usually like, hey, do this or don't do this. But here are some things to, to be aware of. Uh, a lot of those law books, especially like just the Torah, where a lot of the laws are put there, some people think that it's literally just like law after law after law. In some sections it is, but there's still the story of the Jewish people right there. So for example, Exodus, it has some laws, but it's also the story of the exodus from Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, numbers, it does have a lot of laws, but it's also the story of all the Jews wandering through the wilderness, right? Um, so there's still stories happening throughout these, but then there are the law portions where it's just like, here's the commands mm -hmm. and list them all. And um, when you're reading these commands, the moral ones are really easy. So when it says, don't kill or don't murder anyone, right? So thou shalt not kill. Very easy to figure out. But for the judicial part. So the Jews had their own nation and they had their own laws specific to their nation. When we read those laws, we might have to actually ask, hey, what does that mean for us, right? What, like, what does that mean for today? Because obviously um, a law way back then that the Jews had 
We don't have that law today, so what can we do with it? Uh, and a good example is in the New Testament, um, it's, it's right up there actually, there's, there's, a, there's a law in the Old Testament about just like oxes, but Paul applies it to his freedom and literally shows us an example of that in, in 1 Corinthians. So uh, what Paul did, what he, he, he focused on the principles under the law, even though it was like a law just about oxes. He, he found the principle and then said, hey, that still applies to me today. Um, and, that, and that's what he did. And we would have to do the same thing with the um, sacrificial laws um, and, and those. So even though Jesus fulfilled all of those, like Will was saying a little bit earlier, when we're talking about like Passover, all these laws of things we're supposed to do, they have rich imagery. They have rich meaning. Let's figure out what that imagery and meaning is so we can actually realize that um, message that's being given to us. So like uh, with all the sacrificing with the lambs and the goats, what did a goat represent? What did a lamb represent? What's the imagery behind it? Mm -hmm. And that's how you can figure out um, really how to apply it to your life today or how it could change your view of Jesus today. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Just a quick thing on, uh, it's a good contrast between the one I just gave, narrative history and then law, is prescriptive versus descriptive things. If you're ever reading something in scripture, you should ask, is this a prescriptive thing? or a descriptive thing. Is this something God is prescribing me to do, or is this just describing something that happened? So people will often like read about the patriarchs um, and, and see that they're polygamous. They had multiple wives. And they'll say things like, uh, "Did God like so God's okay with polygamy? That's an example of failing to recognize that there's a distinction between a prescriptive thing and a descriptive thing. God isn't saying, thou shalt have 50 wives. He's, they're describing, this happened. Right? And we're going to write it down because this is history um, versus thou shalt not covet or something like that. So mm -hmm. it's just important to keep that in mind. And then wisdom literature. So <clears throat> this is uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the book of Job. Um, and these are kind of general truths that are meant to, to that will apply to a wide variety of contexts. And it's not like things aren't 100% certain every single time. So an example of this would be like, Train up a child in the way that he should go, is an example. That's kind of broad. It's a general kind of wisdom statement. But does that mean that every single time you train up a child, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen exactly like that? Not exactly. Um, it's, it's a general principle that's meant to guide us on the right path in life. Um, so kind of, yeah, I can't, I've said general 600 times, but yeah. general <laughs> guidance, I would say, for the people of God. Um, and then, like, the way this works out in these different books is Psalms is, like, the kind of law for the people. Uh, it's used in worship and stuff. Um, Proverbs is kind of saying like, do well and good things will happen to you. That's kind of the theme of Proverbs. So like, don't be an idiot and things are gonna work out great. Ecclesiastes is saying basically, no matter what you do, you're gonna die. <laughs> That's what Ecclesiastes is saying, but with actually really good meaning behind it. But uh, doesn't matter what you do, you're gonna die anyway. Everything's vanity. And then Job is kind of a combination of all these things. So Job's very righteous, yet nothing good happens to him. He gets like everything taken away from him. It's like Proverbs and Job is kind of an interesting juxtaposition where uh, Job is like, he does well, yet everything gets taken from him. But in the end, it gets redeemed. So Job's kind of a combination of these different wisdom uh, principles weaved into a narrative story. Mm. But it's cool to think of these as like, these four books are, are these four big books mm. of the Bible um, connect in a really cool way. Yeah. And, and well, oh no, here's one last thing on Job. So one of the reasons Job is an actual thing is because there is that contradiction, the, the apparent contradiction between Proverbs and like Ecclesiastes, like, hey, do well and you'll, you'll do good. If you do bad or foolish things, things won't work out. And then Ecclesiastes is like, hey, even if you make money, you're going to die. You're going to be the same off as someone who's poor. Um, there seems to be like a contradiction, like, hey, do these things, but also doesn't matter. Job is kind of the answer to that, the solution, um, and the answer is a, is a story, and Job is actually poetry, so um, the God answered that contradiction in a kind of like, think of it like a poetical narrative, right, um, but yeah, and that actually leads us to poetry, which is, uh, this, this would include a lot of things, so many of the stories or books of the Bible include tiny sections of like songs or blessings or poetry, and then some books are complete poetry, which is like Psalms, and um, Job is also poetry, but with these, 
uh, one of our principles was interpret literally with the normal use of figurative language. The thing with poetry is that figurative language is used a lot more. So uh, you, would, you might have to kind of like tweak that principle a little bit just for poetry um, because you're going to see it a lot. And so normal use of figurative language in poetry would just increase. So make sure you have an eye out for those things. Mm -hmm. And then another very common thing in poetry is repetition or parallelism. So it's just repeating things or kind of aligning things very nicely. And the, the thing I wanted to talk about with this is don't, uh, don't think that every time they repeat something, they're like conveying a brand new uh, message. So if they repeat something, it's really just like emphasis, like, hey, this is important. Mm -hmm. So when we're singing a song in worship and we hit the chorus for the second time, it's not saying, oh, the, hey, the, the, the chorus means something completely different than when we just sung it like a minute ago. It's, it's just using it for emphasis, like, hey, this is important. Mm -hmm. um, so in the example we gave, it's show me your ways and teach me your paths. Kind of saying the same thing. It's not, uh, it's not saying, oh, show me your ways is something completely different than teach me your paths. It's just saying, hey, this is probably something you should keep an eye out for because it's important because they're repeating it. Yeah. yeah. All right, then, Gospels, the good news. Um, so these are given, like one principle to keep in mind is that these were historical accounts but with lots of theological meaning behind it, and they were given to specific audiences. So it's kind of cool to note this, but Matthew, Jewish audience, written in that context specifically for a Jewish audience. That's why he's constantly appealing back to the Old Testament scriptures, showing how Jesus is the fulfillment of those things. Uh, he's a tax collector. That's important to keep in mind. And he presents Jesus as a king. Uh, Mark, he's writing to more of a Gentile Roman audience, kind of opposing Jesus against Roman culture. Uh, he's an evangelist, and he's kind of portraying Jesus as a servant in contrast to the Romans who think that servanthood is weak. Um, it's kind of a cool narrative that he, that he puts together. Luke, he's also presenting to more of a Greek or Gentile audience. He's a historian. He's a doctor. These are important things to keep in mind. And he's really focusing on Jesus as a man. And of course, all of these things are also in all of the other Gospels too. It's more of a matter of emphasis. And then John is kind of different from the other three Gospels. We call the first three the synoptic Gospels. And then John is kind of separated a bit. John is, I would say, the most theological of the Gospels. And it's written to a universal audience. Uh, John's a fisherman. He's more of a simple, more of a simple man, actually. Uh, the language of John is actually very simple as compared to like a book of Hebrews. Uh, the language is, like the, the vocab is much smaller. Like if you read John 1, it's really cool. The shirt I'm wearing. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the amount of words that John uses is quite small. Like light, life. He uses the same words a lot, word, God. But it's the most deep passage ever. Like John 1, 1 is amazing, but he doesn't use many words. It's really, really cool. Um, and he really emphasizes the divinity of Christ in John. So it's important to keep that in mind. So read horizontally and vertically. That's just saying like, um, we want to keep in mind like, th what is this actual account saying about Jesus? But then also, how does this gospel relate to the other three? Um, is kind of what we're meaning there. So how do the different accounts relate to each other? And then, I don't know what we mean by that last point. To be yeah, well, we kind of forgot the last point. But uh, <laughs> one other thing on uh, the like specific audience for those Gospels, he mentioned the Synoptic Gospels. If you've never heard that before, it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because those are the three that historians and scholars really look at for like when these documents were written and what actually happened. Because John came later, and he, like Will said, it's more theological. So Obviously, theology developed over time, and then John wrote it. So it wasn't like John wrote it down right away for history like the other three. So that's why those three are the synoptic gospels used for the historical account more than John is. Yeah. Right, and that's why if you read like Matthew and then Luke and then Mark, you'll see, wow, this, I'm seeing this a lot of the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're very, uh, there's a lot of repetition, and it seems like it's saying a lot of the same stuff, mm -hmm. whereas John's a little different. Um, now, secular historians will make that divide way too much, and they'll mm -hmm. say basically that John is this later accretion where all, like, originally the Gospels didn't present Jesus as God, 
and then eventually it worked its way way later into Jesus being God, which is not true. There's heavy evidence that that Jesus is God in the Synoptic Gospels, which would be a really cool lecture to do, actually. Oh, yeah, we should. <clears throat> yeah, maybe we'll do that one time. <laughs> All right, um, next one, parables. Uh, these are really easy. They're found within the Gospels. They're specific to, um, to Jesus. We don't really see them uh, anywhere else. Like, Jesus is known for his parables. Um, so just like with poetry, um, it, you can think of this as a kind of like a form of figurative speech. So these aren't like historical accounts that Jesus is giving. They're, they're actually stories, right? They're stories he creates to convey a message. They illustrate truth. Um, and one thing to keep in mind when you run into these parables is read before it. Uh, to figure out the context for the parables. Because it's usually like, oh, the Pharisees and Sadducees did something that caused Jesus to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Or the disciples uh, did something or said something to cause the story. Know what caused these parables. It'll help you figure out the main message behind the stories and why Jesus is um, telling them. And then also, Jesus also explains them to us because (laughs) we... uh, uh, I don't know, maybe we're stupid sometimes. Uh, mm-hmm. But then, yeah, yeah, so but the parables are really nice, and they are actually meant to enlighten believers, but uh, also at times they're meant to make sure that uh, like non-believers don't really understand what it means, um, mm-hmm. which is an interesting concept. But, yeah, yeah. let's keep going. Okay, Acts. We're well, almost done, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes, Acts might get just lumped into historical account, like like other uh, like the other genres. Um, but I actually think it's important to make a distinction in Acts because there's a very clear uniqueness to the book of Acts in terms of, uh, at the same time, noting the historical accounts that are happening in human history with God's influence on them. So a good example would be like Acts 2 and Acts 4, where Peter's preaching a sermon and he's saying, like, uh, all these things took place and you did these things and you crucified Jesus and all, all these different things took place. And this is exactly how God was pre, preordaining all of these things to take place. Um, there's a very strong, like, theological, like, theolo- theological history going on in Acts. Like, God's events in history right here. Um, and it's a unique historical moment in the church. It's the birthing of the church. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Epistles. Uh, so, the letters. So, everything after Acts, before Revelation. All those. So, uh, Paul's letters. Uh, John's letters, um, Peter's letters, all of it, uh, they're didactic, okay? So that just means they're for teaching. So it's going to be pretty easy to figure out what they're teaching you, all right? And they are for the church and individuals. Some passages say, hey, this is how the church should function, and some passages are saying, hey, this is how individuals should act. Um, Again, it's pretty straightforward, um, because they're well-structured, they're intentional, and they're also logical. So Paul is making an argument all the time. Um, he uses so like the word therefore. He uses that so many times um, or, or something like that. So he, he obviously has a chain of thought that people follow. And the cool thing about epistles is you got to remember that they're actual letters. So Paul didn't sit down and write this like, over months and months and months and months and like did like just one tiny section at a time. Um, it was, he was somewhere, he wrote it all for a specific event that he needed to address right away and sent it. Yeah. Um, and then also, since it's a letter, you got to remember that even though we sit down in like Bible studies and slowly go through these epistles, which is great, they're actually meant to just be read all together at once, right? So the letter of Romans um, or the epistle of Romans, it's not meant to... Uh, well, it is, again, uh, we, we sit down and do it for a Bible study, but technically you're just supposed to read through the whole thing just mm-hmm. in one sitting, right? Same with uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians or um, First and Second Peter, all those. You're supposed to sit down and just read them in one sitting at one time. Yeah. yeah a really cool practice actually is to like, if you have like the Bible app, connect it to your car and play the audio and just go through the whole book of Romans and listen to it. That's actually a really cool practice. Like, I did that recently, and it was like, you start to pick up on a lot of stuff, where that break from, like, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, is a little artificial. That those, those chapter headings aren't inspired by God. And so it's cool to actually just listen to the whole thing in big, long chunks. I think you actually get a lot about, a lot more out of it. Mm-hmm. 
this last one. Is our last one. <laughs> We're almost there. Yeah. Uh, apocalyptic literature. So, Revelation is the most um, obvious example of this, but I would say like Daniel has a lot of apocalyptic imagery. Some of the prophets, uh, some of the ending of the Gospels, I would say, uses a lot of apocalyptic language. Jesus is describing the end times when he's actually hearkening back to like Daniel and other other places. Um, these are very difficult to interpret. That doesn't mean they're confusing, or, or that doesn't mean that they're impossible or opaque, or that God isn't clear, but they're historically difficult to interpret. Uh, so it's debated whether this is historical, prophetic, literal, figurative, elements of all of them. Um, it's difficult. These are tough books, and there's a reason why there's lots of disagreement here. Um, I love the quote, uh, John saw many monsters in his vision in Revelation, but none of them were as bad as all of his modern-day interpreters. So there's a million different interpretations of Revelation and a million different ways that people will you know, twist things in Revelation to apply to today. Like a funny example would be like the winged beasts in Revelation being Apache attack helicopters. That's one example. Now, you might actually think that that's true, so I don't want to make fun of that, but it's, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I like this other joke. I got a lot of jokes about Revelation. Um, the pan-millennialist is the one who would say, it's all going to pan out in the end. That's kind of a, a, a good yeah. position to take. Yeah. Like not lazy, but mm-hmm. good, a good position to take. A lot of people argue about the end times and uh, like have different millennial views and um, also debate the rapture and everything, but the pan-millennialist, the pan-millennialist would just say, hey, that's awesome, but Jesus wins. That's all I know. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of the view. And it's a very simple view, and I, and I like it too, because a lot of people can focus like way too much on, on, on the end times and then like not study the rest of the Bible. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, application. Uh, reading the Bible well matters, okay? So it's, uh, it will greatly affect your life. So if you have terrible interpretation principles... Uh, when you go to read the Bible, it may be difficult, it, you, and because it's difficult, you may find it boring or, mm-hmm. or stupid or, or something like that. But if you have those good principles, you can actually get the meaning, and it will make a difference. And you'll be like, wow, this is actually helpful. It's useful. Um, it's not pointless. Uh, next thing, God communicated a message to us. So God is real. He's the supreme being. And if he communicates something to us, we got to listen, right? Uh, so that right there is just the value and the authority in that biblical message right there to just make us want to know what he is saying. Uh, next, you can use this in group and individual Bible studies. Um, so if you have a group Bible study or participate in one, and your group is uh, maybe following some of these but not a lot of these, bring it to your group. Say, hey, we should try this out, see how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can also use it in your individual Bible study and do something yourself. Um, And then the last thing is we could actually use it to hopefully reduce conflict in the church. If we Mm -hmm. all have uh, good principles of biblical interpretation, well, I I would actually argue that we would have less conflict and there would be less passages that we would end up conflicting on. So if we both read a passage and we're following these good principles, there's a higher likelihood that we'll come to a very similar conclusion, Mm -hmm. right? Reducing the conflict, which will... um, kind of encourage unity and bring about unity, which is very important, especially today. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to say? Nope. Oh, sweet. All right. We'll just pray us out here. Lord, we thank you for your divinely inspired word, and we thank you for its truth. We thank you for its richness and its depth that we will never uh, fully comprehend. Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll never fully plumb the depths of your word. Um, Over 2,000 years, no Christian ever has. The church never has uh, fully plumbed the depths of of your word, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we can make that a lifelong study. I pray that you invigorate our hearts and our minds to be on fire for your word, that we would seek out how to read it well, that we would use these principles to do so, uh, that we would help each other out in that endeavor, as it can be difficult, and we are finite and and weak. So I pray that you would strengthen us, Lord, in that, and just light our hearts on fire for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. All right, so that was a long... uh, 